Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Jack Hart returns to the show. Jack is one of the leading esoteric researchers in the alternative research community today. His writings are focused on revealing the mass deception taking place by the mainstream scientific and academic gatekeeper community. A link to Jack's current article, A Teapot and the Toroidal Universe, can be found in the description box below. The discussion with Jack was, as always, wide-ranging as we talk about his work, the esoteric message of David Lynch's Twin Peaks, and whether we exist in a simulation. And so without further ado, here's the conversation with Jack Hart. All right, Jack, so welcome back to the show. The last time you were on the show was back in June of 2017. We talked about your last article, which was Peter Pan Meets Pyramid Head, and you have a new article out today. It's the Teapot and the Toroidal Universe. I'll get it right was up on VT. It's also up on your blog. And um, one of the things that I picked up from your, your new article, Jack, is uh, David Lynch plays a huge part in what is going on behind the scenes with your research and the articles. And I was wondering, how did you get David Lynch looped into this? How did I get into looking into David Lynch? Well, that's something we really need to talk about because I'm getting all this shit, so to say, from my fans so or from my military intelligence or well, I wouldn't even call them military intelligence. Oh, I got a lot of uh I got a lot of ex military people readers and, you know, they were in their field and stuff and, and they they oh why are you doing movies? You know I'm doing movies because 'cause I've been following an evidentiary trail. Okay? I've been following it since the first Black Sun Rising. This is where it led. First it led to Silent Hills, and then I found out that David Lynch was behind Silent Hills. I mean, the, um, the first article I wrote about this, uh, I forgot even what we named it, um, but it was about the first two seasons of Twin Peaks. I laid the case out for you. Let me go through Silent Hills first, a little history of Silent Hills. Okay, it's, it's three games, all right? They come out in 1999. Now... The first game was nothing really strange about it. It was a really good game. I mean, it took, took the gaming community by storm. Everybody in this town has turned into a monster from taking drugs, and they were trying to raise up a god. Uh, through their consciousness, they went into an alternate reality. But that's the first game. Now, the second game, it's different. It takes a, it takes a lynch, I like to call it a lynchian twist. With all all three egos, like Pyramid Head is more or less a doppelganger of the protagonist. There's goddess worship, which Lynch is very big on goddess worship. It takes a decidedly Lynchian twist in the second game. By the third game, the protagonist, she was like an Adina or something. She goes back to this town and uh, she seeks vengeance on the priestess. And you played it through, you were a teenage girl and she was fighting monsters and killing them. And, you know, she's a, a you know, she's like Wonder Woman. But in any case, they come out with the movies. These these these, these games, they, 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 they had like three of them. They go up to 2003 and then they get the... Uh, they made a last one, and it's about a guy locked uh, locked in a room, more or less, or in a house, I think it is, and it's it's a little different. Uh, and he, go, he keeps going; he's in a closed loop, so to say. This is this is big. This is big in Twin Peaks, dude. The closed loop. Now, 2006, they come out with this fancy movie, Silent Hill. It was really good. I, I mean, the critics, they, they, it was like they they were trying to pan it. They tried everything, but this, the thing still made a lot of money. People loved it. Everybody in that movie gave Lynch credit, for, you know, a lot of credit for it. Even, uh, even the director said he was heavily influenced by it. There was a Japanese company to come out with these games. And the name of the, the designers was Team Silent, you know. Uh, need I say more? The musical composition for it was, uh, the guy was like, he, he basically copied Angelo Baldometti, who was uh, Twin Peaks musical composer and the director for these, these Silent Hill games, uh, Basically, he never even watched horror. He just, the only thing he watched was Lynch, he told people. Was, these were the Japanese guys. But in any case, you come out with these movies in 2006. After that movie, they didn't do anything. They, they, they lived off these first four games made by this Team Silent and this giant Japanese conglomerate. They were making these other games. They were, they were not the same. They weren't as good. And in 2012, I think it was, they come out with the second Silent Hills. And this is about everything I've been writing about. Uh, that's where I got the name Peter Pan Meets Pyramid Head uh, when I watched this movie. I, I wouldn't have never watched this movie. I was told to watch it. 
As a matter of fact, I was cajoled. I didn't want to watch it into watching it. First time I watched it, I realized what I was watching. After that, I, I, you know, I started really looking into it, that this was like last year, last summer. In 2014, they come out with this PT. It was supposed to be a teaser for an interna interactive game. They hired this Mexican horror director. He does all the big horror films. He's considered the greatest horror director. And they teamed him up with the, the, supposedly the greatest Japanese horror game designer. And they made just a little promo. Uh, it was, you know, it was nothing like the, you know, the regular games. And they called it PT. And it was about a guy who's, again, you're in the loop, like the fourth game. Uh, and he's trapped in a room and he, he wakes up and his whole family is murdered. And he's got to figure out, you know, where he is, who he is, what happened. And, you know, gamers went crazy over this. It was rated like the fourth greatest horror game, and it was only a promo, okay? And now, this promo, they were supposed to come out with the Silent Hills uh, game, 2016. Everybody's all excited the game. It was the biggest thing in the gaming world. All of a sudden, this company cancels this game. And they says, oh, they can't make this game because of the, the director and everybody was all fighting all of a sudden. But it was bullshit. It was really bullshit. He said, she said thing. But in any case, out comes this book. The Secret History of Twin Peaks. And now, now you find out David Lynch is going to come back with Twin Peaks. What does uh, Lynch have to do with Silent Hill? I, I don't know if I, I caught that. Everybody in Silent Hill, I haven't credited them with the influence, but this is the kicker now. In Silent Hills, they're using a sequence of numbers in this PT game, okay? Uh, the guy's running around in a loop and there's a radio playing, okay? And it's in Swedish, this announcement. And it's saying the Orson Welles uh, broadcast in 37 was real, you know, and they're really here, and like they're taking over, and this is the resistance. And he keeps repeating these numbers, the sequence of numbers. When you run these numbers into the computer, you uh, Google them, you'll get a tree. It's a tree that grows in the, in the, the, uh, on the West Coast. It's, useful, it's heavily used for lumber, and it was the first tree that was ever mapped, the, the genomes were mapped. Now, this studio that came out with this PT game, they have the numbers 7780 on them. Inexplicably, if you run those into Google, you will come up with the same tree, okay? And uh, the genome chart again. I don't know why. I don't think anybody knows why, but, but that's the way it works. If you Google 7780, you'll come up with this genome chart and the, this uh, tree. The point is that the tree is heavily logged and it's found on the West Coast. The gaming fans were starting to say, well, this this means that they're going to move the site because the site of of, uh, of Silent Hills was in Pennsylvania in a, in a coal mine fire, okay? Uh, that's where, where Silent Hills town was supposed to be. But everybody was speculating, these gamers were speculating that they were going to move the site over to the West Coast. Now, these numbers almost match up. There's an extra one in there, okay? But they match up perfectly with the numbers on the pole that is in Fire Walk With Me of the movie that they made in 1992. He's also using that pole a lot in Twin Peaks 2017. And this is David Lynch. This is Lynch using these numbers. Yes, okay. yes. Yep. It's just six, six or seven numbers. I mean, it would, the odds are for me at the one that, that, that those numbers would match perfectly. There's an extra one thrown in, but even so. With everything else, with the with the tree, the West Coast thing, Twin Peaks on, in the West Coast, all of it adds up that this was a promo. This PT was never supposed to be a promo for Silent Hill. It was supposed to be a promo for TP, Twin Peaks. Now, this book that Frost wrote, it's written like a dossier, like an FBI dossier. And the agent, I think, is Tammy Preston. Her initials are TP. And he goes through all his book. He's addressing TP. She's in, she's in 2017, Twin Peaks. She's hot, so they should make a series with her. But like, <laughs> But in any case, the, the evidence is, is uh, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I, I, you know, I'm just talking now. I'm not looking at notes or anything. If I ever looked at notes, I could, you, could, you could get a conviction in the court of, any court of law on the evidence. It's all laid out in the first one. You know, the, my first post on Twin Peaks, I got the picture of the goddess on it with the owl. That was another thing he kept talking about is the, the, uh, in the book. Uh, the owls are not what they seem. And he's got a picture, a 3D picture, and if you look at it a certain way, it's a gray alien. And the owl is the symbol of, as you know, is the symbol of Lilith, yeah. of Athena, of the goddess, you know. There's a heavy influence of goddess worship through this whole thing, and it winds from 
1992. Now, you watched the first Twin Peaks. Well, the first Twin Peaks, I mean, the owl is very prominent. Right, right, right. Well, the owl was the theme in the first two. The owls are, are, are symbolic of, uh, of something I've seen. It's, they call it the Morph Man. There's pictures of it in, in the, in the, uh, a lot of the glyphs, too, uh, from Australia, from the South, America's Southwest, by the Anasazi. The Mothman? Yes. And so the owl is a masking symbol for this being. The aborigine in Australia were very, very familiar. They called these, these Wajina, and that the Wajina were responsible. They were nature spirits, the weather. They, they, they made the lightning and the wind and the, the storms. And, that was the, the gods they worship, the Wajina, and they have pictures of them, you know, and the, the pictures match up almost perfectly with the glyphs in the caves of, uh, you know, and on the walls of the Southwest Desert by, uh, by what they call the Anasazi. Jack, what is Lynch telling us? It's the rape and murder of the goddess Persephone. That's what it is. That's what Laura Palmer is. But he, he explains it all in 2017. Okay. He does a, a magnificent job, just magnificent. Nice job storytelling. I, I, that's why I feel compelled to actually uh, explain what he's talking about, because uh, I think you need a Ph.D. in the occult to understand him. He's got the Nazi bell, and by the third episode, I mean, it's got the dents in it from Kecksburg, and, and nobody's even talking. Now they are, because we, we released it. And this is in the new Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks Returns? Yes, yes. Good Glock is writing this reality. This is, uh, they're actually, they're injecting things onto us. Everything we talk about, you know, the, and the giant, uh, Frost is saying he's metaphorical for the Syrians, for the tall Norths, it says right in the book. Okay, I, I thought the, the giant in part one had to do with uh, the giants in uh, Hyperborea. No, I think, uh, I think you're closer than Frost is. I'm telling you, like, Frost does not know what Lynch is thinking. Uh, Frost is, Frost is grasshopper. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be glad to know that. He's got a lot to learn. <laughs> no, he's very, very good. Oh, his stuff on, on Jack Parsons, I'm going to use. He's, he's very good. He's a yeah. brilliant researcher. Uh, I, my, um, my hat goes off to him, too. So I, I think Lynch is like as high a ranking Illuminati, quote unquote, as you get, you know? Yeah. As you yeah. get. You find out he's in, his hands are in everything in Hollywood. Let me just fill the audience in a little bit for some folks that may not be familiar with David Lynch. So David Lynch, he's a director, a screenwriter, producer. He's a painter, a musician, an actor, and a photographer. Some of the movies that, and this is just some of the movies, folks, I'm going to pick out ones that are probably easily recognizable by the audience. Eraserhead, he was the director and writer. The Elephant Man, he was the director and writer. Dune, he was the director and writer. Blue Velvet, Wild at Heart, Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, which you just mentioned, Jack. And uh, another one here I'll put out there is Mulholland Drive from 2001, where he was also the director and the writer. And there's many, many, many more. So he's a true Renaissance man. And I agree with you that David Lynch is probably as high as one could get who is in the public eye, in the pyramid within the, um, the, the fraternal order of the, of the Illuminati. See, somehow he got... He got uh... He got permission to talk about something you're not supposed to be able to. They won't let me release my book for the simple reason that nobody's ever supposed to talk about the Babylon working. That's what 2017, that's what it's really about. I, I mean, what he's got is like you're saying the Hyperboreans. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Operation High Jump in 1947 yeah. when the United States tried to go in there. They didn't do very well. They got junk is, uh, experimental junk is missing that nobody ever found. Uh, this bell was never found. 200 missing freaking submarines. Where'd they all go? They never rounded up a single SS officer of any importance, you know? None of the, uh, the SS, like you said, anyone of any noteworthy was. They all walked. The freaking guy who ran the postal service was his best friend. He, he was he was the guy. Uh, if you, you, they were going to they were going to use TVs like you you got into that with the TVs about how they they're like scrying screens and stuff. Uh, yep. They were going to have everybody have a TV, and the postal service was supposed to be in charge of this. Well, that's what your phone is, right? Your phone is a scrying mirror. Yeah, yeah. yeah the post, the German postal the, for the Nazis. The, this guy, I forget his name. I think it was Hitler's main confidant. Before that, it was the other guy, Tosh, but I think he died in a plane crash going to talk to Hitler about the way they were running the war in 41. So after that, it became this other guy. He just walked. There's no reason they would let a guy like that. I mean, he's basically the bag man for the whole black budget of the Nazi party. They talk about all the billions and billions of dollars. That are missed. This guy knew where they were. 
He's the one who handled it. How come they just let him walk away? The other guy, Dorsch, she becomes a becomes a head of the, the biggest construction company in Germany. You know, they're building a city right now. They're building a city for uh, for one of these rich uh, Arab sheep domes. You know, in Marseille, it's like a flying saucer too. He's supposedly specialized in underground construction. Another guy just walked. He was millions of people in slave labor. He, he walked away and became a billionaire. This Nuremberg trials was a farce. They cut a deal. That's what happened. Borman walked out with the money. The British, they threw Operation Market Garden to make the war last a year longer. So Borman could finish liquidating the funds and sending them to Argentina. Uh, and God only knows where else, you know. Uh, the Brazil... And they, I know they want, they're in the Antarctic. Too. What do you think those boats they go and carry and them are going back and forth over there? What do you think? They're going to look at penguins, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All these people going to the Antarctic. You see, these people are watching the stupid shit on the news with Donald Trump. What, what is, this guy's a freaking game show host. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they tell him to stick, stick his thumb in his butt and blow a balloon up. He'll do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our parents will be sitting there watching you. <laughs> he's going to save America. <laughs> he's going to make America great again. Yeah. That's how he's doing. He's blowing the balloon up with, with his finger in his butt, you see. <laughs> he's got a plan. <laughs> but in any case, in any case, uh, Kerry went down there. He's the head of the skull and bones. Why, why do you think he went down there? Yeah, oh. yeah, John Kerry, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's stuff I can't say right now, but... <laughs> I'm hoping it'll come out in the end, but I really don't care. It's well, when you when you are ready to say it, you can't say it. You come back on the show and you tell us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't talk to anybody else, but you know, I'm not. I, I you know, I, I, first of all, you know, you know what I think of you two. We already went through that. You yeah, two be yeah. liars, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I cut a tape with you, and I get I get I get. I'm lucky if I get two thousand views in two days. I write. A piece and it gets 5,000 views in a day on my blog, not counting all the other places it's published. You're going to tell me what? They don't want to hear an interview, but they all want to read what I write. You know. Exactly. Yep. They're deliberately knocking down hits on the stuff that's important and blowing up the stuff that's nonsense. Uh, and, and by the way, anybody who's listening to this, you see one of those freaking YouTube tapes with this guy you never heard of talking about, oh, with this Satanist or the angels and revelations, and it's got 150,000 hits. That's an NSA tape, okay? Because if the guy was telling you the truth, it wouldn't go over three or 4,000 hits, okay? The founder of the holographic paradigm, Carl Prebrum, has got 27,000 hits when I, when I did the research on YouTube. Are you kidding me? There had to be more researchers that, alone that wrote articles on this guy's work that looked at that freaking tape than 27,000. But this is the way YouTube plays the game. So ignore, ignore what they say about hits because they're vile. They openly practice this, so it's a nonsense site. But then again, having said that, there's no other way for artists like you to get your work out. Somebody else. So I wish somebody else would start something, you know? Well, that's the thing. It's still the largest platform to get your work out. You do have to be really careful as a content provider on YouTube to make sure that they don't hit you with copyright strikes or uh, community guideline strikes and all that stuff. But you're absolutely right, Jack. Well, they suspended the uh, veterans today, but that, I think that was the... Uh, Facebook that did it because they printed the picture of Ivana Trump with her girlfriend in bed. That picture's all over the world. It's all in every magazine and every freaking way. And they suspended them. But in any case, yeah, selective enforcement, that's what, the, that's what they're practicing. I'm doing scientific papers now for research. And the way these guys talk about Einstein's theory of relativity, it's like a guy kowtowing in front of a king. You know, they can't heap enough praise on it. And then they say, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, the honorable love, the much loved Dr. Einstein and his theory of special <laughs> relativity, which changed the world and has been proven. And this is a scientific paper, you know, and they got to they got to do that. They got to do that. It ain't going to get published. This is YouTube's agenda and this is Facebook's agenda. Then they got Zuckerberg walking around. You see the pictures I published to him? Oh, I didn't publish them. Somebody else published them. I shared them on Facebook. He's got his legs folded up like in the, uh, like in the arrival, you know which is a great science fiction movie featuring JPL as they really are. He's walking his dog and he's got his knees folded. It's, it's really funny. It's really, uh, he doesn't look human. It looks just, you've seen the arrival, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's walking just yeah. like one of those things. 
I'm not so sure he exists. I'm not so sure Bill Gates exists or any of these people. These people are just front men. They're front men. They're front men. Yeah. 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 I mean, you think Mark Zuckerberg developed Facebook? You don't know shit. You don't know shit. (laughs) You you know, like there's like there's certain players, some of them Jewish billionaires, others the Jesuits, others royal families in Europe, you know. So you go and say, it's a handful of families and... They run the whole fucking world. It's a, it's a fife dome to them, and we're the peasants, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, you'd be lucky they don't decide that we, you know, we're noisy, we're ugly. You know, a lot of us are getting quite ugly from eating the poison they make us eat. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've seen a, a thing on Facebook today. It's like the only reason the elite keep us alive is so they can molest our children, which is true. <laughs> The only reason they don't kill all the thousands is so they can molest their children, which is probably tr- closer to the truth than anything else, you know? <laughs> they're so twisted. They're so sick. It's just, you know, it gets to the point where, I guess this is where they're going with it too, Jack, is they oversaturate the news with this stuff. And what happens is after a while is there's a desensitizing that takes place with the public and nobody nobody cares anymore. It's like, I have had enough of this stuff. I wonder if that's that's the strategy. They're changing these people. They, they, they are. It's working on, on, on the uh, on the sheeple, so to say. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of strip, strippers. You know that, right? Well, the other day, I'm in the car. I'm hearing a conversation, right? And they're talking about the men in the clubs, you know? And uh, they're saying that, you know, a lot of them, these guys are actually questioning what, what their sexuality is now. And they were talking about, I never talked to these girls either. You know, they don't know anything about what, what I, and it's like, you know, these, because of what they're seeing in the media, they're still, every guy, they're starting to actually think they're gay, you know, uh, because they're being shown repeatedly uh, of gay role models and stuff, you know. Uh, and they're, they're starting to question their own sexuality to the point where they're telling girls, I don't know if I'm, uh, I'm heterosexual, you know. As he's what, looking at a stripper, he can't figure it out? Yeah, no, exactly. That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. Oh, my God. Oh That's my what God. I'm telling you. This is how controlled they are by the media, too. You know? uh, and it, so, so it's having more than it may not affect us, but it's, I'm like, good, more for me, you know? You know, you, you know like women, good. <laughs> <laughs> you look good in that dress, man. <laughs> You're stunning. You're stunning. <laughs> Oh my God! This interview is spiraling out of control. Okay, so, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> let me let me. I want to ask you a question because you you and I talked about this a couple of months ago, and you threw a date out. The 1983 date, right? The 1983 date. When did reality shift? And how did it shift? And and I was wondering if you can go through that a little bit because here's the thing, right? You gave that date. You said it was, hey, Mike, it was 1983. And then, you know, I'm watching that series, Stranger Things. The date is 1983, which you had said to me, 1983. The 1983 date, Mike, comes from the Montauk Project, because that's the date when they broke through reality. Uh, Yeah, they cracked the hole in reality. When you say they cracked the hole in reality, what does that mean? What did they do? They created an alternate reality, and that's the reality we're in right now, the alternate reality that they created. You watch Twin Peaks uh, Part 1 and 2. Did you know? You notice that all, all the uh, denizens of Twin Peaks are watching a soap opera called Invitation to Love? No, I didn't pick up on that. They're all watching. The, the one guy, the villain, when he gets shot, he's watching himself get shot on TV. Is his Walter on TV. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's Invitation to Love. There's even some fan groups named after that. But they're all watching this, this soap opera, and it's like themselves. They're watching themselves. And we're watching them, and somebody's watching us. It's like Chinese boxes within boxes. But that reality was made in 1983. That reality, the one we're in now, was made in 1983. I don't know how we all got here. I don't know if we all came here at, this, at different times. Well, what happened to the previous reality, Jack? What, what happened? You know, let me back up a second. Let me just get the audience on board. I've had discussions with Jack and with other folks, and I have said that I have a theory, and I'm, I'm pretty convinced that my theory is correct, that a shift took place. 
that the reality we're living in now is not the reality that was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Something took place. Right. We shifted. We shifted into this reality. Like you were saying, we remember Franco Palombo was franking up, uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, Mandela being. Yeah, Kirk Douglas. Uh, yeah, I yeah. remember him dying. We talked about this, right, Kirk Douglas? I, I did, too. We came from a different reality than a lot of these, these other denizens, yeah. Uh, so what what happened to the old reality? Did they blow something up? Did they... There was none. Uh, when you get to episode eight, yeah, they blew us all up. Episode 8 is like the most freaky thing you're ever going to watch of Twin Peaks 2017, if you really know what he's saying. First of all, when they built the, uh, the nuclear bomb, I, I have documented all that. They didn't really know how to build a nuclear bomb. Uh, the one who built the nuclear bomb for them was Enrico Fermi, and he was a defector from, from the, the Axis, okay? He, he, he's an Italian, he married a Jew. But he was in with all, you know, the German and Italian scientists, the, the great ones. He came over here, and he he uh, he, he built this nuclear bomb for them. Uh, he showed them how to enrich uranium. Uh, he built the reactor. Uh, it was all uh, they they would have never got it done. It was it was a joke. They were they, they were making like a gram a day of enriched uranium, two hundred thousand dollars in nineteen forties money. It was like yeah. they 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 didn't even have half half of what they needed to blow one off. They got all this from U-234. But in any case, Fermi built them this bomb. And he told them, do not test it. This is just like, this is like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, peace through superior firepower or, you know, balance of power. Uh, you know, that, that's the reason the, it was just supposed to be we have it. Because if you blow this thing up, the explosion will keep going and it will take out the whole universe. And they laughed at him. They laughed at the guy who built the thing, basically. This is how stupid they are. And in any case, they went out in that desert and they tested that thing. And he was shitting himself when they did. He, he was, uh, it was a, a joke among them, you know, because he, you know, he swore to them. I, I think he, uh, the other guy, open eye, had a bet with him, you know. He had to collect the money after they lived through it, you know. And, and meanwhile, Oppenheim is reading the poem from the Bhagavad Gita, I am become like God, destroyer of worlds. Well, what happened is, is that, that that explosion kept going. And Lynch shows it in episode eight, and then he's got Nine Inch Nails uh, doing that scene of them playing that, that song. And that that is probably the most disturbing thing I have ever seen on film. That has to be seen to be believed. But uh, it's a song about how the goddess is dead, and you're all dead. And what happens is an alternate reality. Your consciousness doesn't just cease. First of all, we don't die, okay? Consciousness doesn't cease. These are just material bodies anyway. They carry them. Uh, like I said in that, that, that post, your, your consciousness is separate. They know this now. Neurologists know this, okay? This is hard science, all right? There's no way to neurologically account for, for the quick synapses and uh, workings of the brain with the science they have. There's no physical way. There's something else. They've blended neuroscience now with quantum physics. With death, your consciousness doesn't die, man. It just, it, we, all, all that happened is we created a new consciousness, a new universe. The Germans had the nuclear bomb, and this is known now. They even got areas where they tested it. But they weren't using it as a weapon. They were using it to open up portals, you know, and it had to be done in exactly the right way. And I guess they were using it to open up portals uh, into other dimensions. The Germans, by 1931 had already created a separate reality. And uh, what Lynch is showing is these Hyperboreans, or these Germans, and they're with the goddess, the mother goddess, and they're in a room, and they see that these stupid <laughs> have just spilled their planet up. And they're sitting there with the Nazi bell, the Dagak. And an alarm's going off on it, and he looks at the gauges, and he's like, oh, no, uh, this is the giant. And then they go through this thing where he's... Uh, uh, they make a ball, like a, like a golden globule, and they, they lock Laura Palmer inside. And uh, at the same time, they lock the devil inside, too. It was this guy, Bob. Uh, and uh, they take it like there's a golden glock, that glock on the top of this vaulted room, okay? And it's got like this, this attachment, this horn. That's where you get the teapot from. And the attachment sucks this golden globule in. And it injects it onto this giant screen that they have. Actually, a giant TV screen. And it materializes into the screen. And then it plummets down to Earth. And it's swallowed by a young girl. And that's what he's saying. This reality is created there. I think it's 1956. Now, everybody's dates may not be correct. 
Uh, everybody's using a 1983 date, but that 83 date is time from when this reality started. As you know, I think, uh, there are a multiplicity of realities. This is real science. This is not your f***ing stupid Morgan Freeman science, all right? Well, read what I write, uh, anybody who doubts this. These guys are Von Neumann, uh, you ever the third? They didn't work. They didn't teach in colleges. They didn't go on TV. They were sucked up by the government before they even got out of high school. Uh, I think uh, Von Neumann went to the highest bidder. And the guy invented almost everything we have in the 21st century. Hugh Everett wrote his paper the, uh, uh, saying the wave function uh, was continuous. And then it went deep black. He, got, he took over von Neumann's place. Von Neumann, Neumann died early. Uh, and, and Everett took over. And everything he wrote after that was deep black. And then nothing else after that. He just worked for the government. And it spawned the Atomic Energy Commission, which, by the way, they were the first ones in, in into the tunnels. But then again, You've got a multiplicity of realities all fusing together. What the real reality is, going back to the Montreal Projects as a source, is uh, by 1931 they created an alternate reality. And I'm going by what Preston Nichols told me, too. And this is basically, they drew this reality. I remember him telling me uh, that the Civil War, the South really won. Yeah. And that was the first thing they had to change because they couldn't have this. You know, this would be a, a collection of city states. We wouldn't have this freaking uh, this police state we have here. Uh, I guess you would have a utop more utopian society. I'm not, I'm not going to say utopian, but it would be a lot better world. And they changed that to the North one in the Civil War. And I, you know, when I when I used to uh, talk to Preston Nichols, I used to take what he said with a grain of salt. But later on in my research, I, I find that uh, Booth. There was a big conspiracy with Booth, uh, and they were saying his substitute body was used in the shootout when he was killed, and they wouldn't let nobody see the body, and they sequestered it, and none of his family were allowed to see it. Uh, and you know what? They sequestered it on a battleship docked off of uh, Virginia named the Montauk. And, and he didn't know this when he told me this story. You know, this is something I found out in my research. You know, like he didn't talk about synchronicities. He's not synchronicities. This is a program, man, uh, and I think the program actually builds on itself, too. As you find certain things out, it will, uh, it will fill in the blanks. And that's why we have a lot of stuff around that we can't explain, like we have these monuments and we have these uh, obvious evidences of past civilizations, but we have no real evidence. Uh, you know, we have no writing, we have no, no advanced crafts, weaponry, uh, tools, because... Because this is only, like he said, in the monotrope body. If you just put enough in, this is what Von Neumann figured out, you inject just enough to create a background reality to convince the soul that, that it's attached to a timeline, because otherwise madness ensues. 83 is the date given by uh, uh, Preston Nichols in the Montauk Project. And later it's given us the beginning of Silent Hills. And now, uh, yes, uh, Stranger Things. Well, Stranger Things is kind of interesting, you know, because when I watch the series, I watch season one and season two, they're clearly depicting that they, they pierce the veil into another dimension. They're showing what they're calling the upside down world. Look at the toroidal universe. There's two worlds. There's two worlds. In one world, like there's the, from the spin in the vortex, spinning one way and spinning the other way. And one world, one, we're getting sucked into a black hole and everything is contracting. And out the other end, we're being expelled through what they call a white hole, and everything is expanding. And that section, is that torus, is divided into two, two parts. And in one part, there's a world which sees everything expanding. And in the other part, there's a world which sees everything contracting. Okay. There's two, actually three worlds, just like they say in the Vita, and just like Lynch keeps saying, between two worlds, because between and in, in between, that's where the equilibrium is. That's where the red room is, by the way, in David Lynch's red room. But that's where equal. That's a small. That's another world. That's the three worlds of the V. Just constantly talk about three, three worlds. The three worlds. They're using the Taurus now to explain all this. The scientists are going to the Taurus. You know, of course, you'll have the you know the fossils and the relics and uh, that are still teach the uh, you know the, the spherical universe. There's so many inherent problems with the spherical universe, as you know from the flat earth thing. A, a sphere brings so many mathematical problems into yeah. making it into a reality. And uh, those will disappear with the toroidal universe. Everything falls into place. 
which is why they're going to it. But of course, you'll still have this spherical universe, guys, because that's where they get their government grants from. They're not going to switch what they're saying. They, or what? Go work at Burger King? Now, Jack, there's a lot of theories out with regard to the German bell, but what was it designed to do exactly? Punching, punches hole in the wave functions. That's what Lynch is showing it, though. You know, it's actually it's actually writing reality. Uh, everything is based on a wave function. Bell Labs discovered this in 1937, won the Nobel Prize for it. They proved it. There is no particles. The, the thing is a wave function. And what von Neumann said after he wrote the, the foundations of quantum physics is that the wave function is only bent by, by consciousness. It's it's not really bent at all. As he's saying, basically, well, that's not when we create this reality, your consciousness creates this reality. Whatever it did, it said it doesn't even bend at all. Well, von, von Neumann didn't go that far. So so what, whatever it said is, is this is an illusion. Uh, you know, we're making this all up. There is no matter. There, it doesn't exist. This is hard science. And what they're doing now is they're working on this. They're using frequencies. They can get into different dimensions. They've got their own space program. All that shit is true. What do you think all this money is going, you know? So this basically, we're, we're in a, uh, a simulation, and it's almost like a computer yes. program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just what he talks about in the Monto Project. We're an electromagnetic bottle. And uh, what they're doing is they're pumping it in the background. You know, that, that's why a lot of things don't add up historically and stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, you got that Russian scientist, and he's brilliant. I read his I have his book. I didn't read the whole thing. But uh, he says we've got 300 years missing in our history, you know, from the Dark Ages. Are you talking about Anatoly Fomenko? Yes. So how, how does all this happen? All this happens because we're in a simulated reality. How did these people become like this anyway? You, now, you and I, we talk about this all the time. You drive on the road, they're trying to, uh, everybody's trying to run you into a pole. Uh, the way to get over in a lane is you don't signal. This way you fool them and they can't speed up and block you. Uh, I just, uh, just, I've seen a drastic change in people. There's a lack of empathy. Let themselves go all the shit physically, most of them. Uh, I think you said it best with the bizarro. It's, uh, this is a bizarro world. Everything that used to be bad is good now. You know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it seems to be no way to rectify it. You can't change them. You can't. You're talking to a program, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's, what's very disconcerting is um, that you can point out what's clearly wrong or what's clearly missing, and they don't get it. You know, if they do get it, they'll forget it the next day, you know. And they'll be like, what? 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 No, I don't believe that anymore. Bill O'Reilly straightened me out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, he's looking out for us, you know. <laughs> yeah, he explained everything to me. By the way, going with that 1931 alternate reality, you will notice in Twin Peaks that it's always taking place in a black and white uh, furnished a room, furnished with people dressed like in 1931, and the room is furnished in 1931. So it's even before World War II, uh, which was one thing that troubled me. With, 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 you know, and then when I, I remembered that stuff with the 1931 date, with this, this, this was uh, this reality yeah. was supposed to create it. And that's exactly what they dress like. It's 1931. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting to Twin Peaks 2017. What's that called? Return of Twin Peaks? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, Jack. With what you know, you're going to love. You're going to love the Return of Twin Peaks. That's the thing. It's like what I know now, I can understand it a lot more. It's like that quote David Lynch had in, in one of his talks where he said, if you have a golf ball size consciousness, you'll have a golf ball size understanding and a golf ball size awareness, right? So back in the 1990s, I had a golf ball size consciousness. So I was not going to really understand. But none of us did. That's another thing. Things. Where did we, how did we get like we are? I mean, a lot of us have changed a lot. And we don't fit in socially anymore. I don't know about no. you, but, I, you know, uh, you can't sit there and watch a football game with me no more. You know, I can't do stuff like that. I just. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't pay any attention to any of that stuff anymore. Yeah. I, I, even the movie, like, like I keep telling these people, oh, why well, you do a movie? You know, I didn't want, I was the last, they had to cajole me into watching these movies, you know? Yeah, yeah. This has been something where they're trying to wake people up. You know, they can't come around and say this. I mean, comments are made by certain people on my blog. This is stuff that's never supposed to be said in public. You know, they, they, they have their uh, prescribed reality for the untermensch and it's not theirs. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, again, everything is layered because I don't think theirs is real either. Uh, and, and that's what Lynch is telling them. 
I think they're fighting over an illusion. So what happens when we die? I mean... <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it promising. shows that they go up to the wires and they go and they get reincarnated right back in again because we're living in an electrical net, you know. Uh, yeah. Unless you're That's not here in the first really place. Depressing. Well, some of them aren't here in the first place. Uh, some of us aren't really here. These are doppelgangers, what you call tulpas and uh, clones. In the uh, in Twin Peaks 2017, you have clones, you have do a doppelganger, yeah, you have one doppelganger, and that's that's of Cooper, and then you've got uh, Tulpas, uh, which is uh, and clones, which I think are interchangeable. I'm not sure, but a Tulpa, the actual definition of a Tulpa is a, a magician can create a Tulpa, which is a, rec a replica of himself, which can go anywhere and do things for him without actually putting himself there, you know, Okay. which is, is what Cooper does. The point being that you're not here, your soul's not here. That toroidal donut is your soul, that election is not here, and they can't trap that. And by the way, uh, Bell won their last Nobel Prize but for creating a spark that can be an uh, electrical spark, a discharge that can be transplanted to another place and worked on. 2014, they won that one. And I think that was their last Nobel Prize. I have another theory about 2014. Yeah, do you want to talk about it or no? I think time stops dead in 2014. That's what I think. I think it's actually stopped dead. I think that we're living in a we're living in a frozen world right now, and I think that's the reason for a lot of this Mandela effect thing, because time's frozen. It shows it in Twin Peaks where the clock actually freezes. Hmm. It's a closed loop. We're at the uh, the number of completion. Two five three. It's the circle's been completed now, and they're waiting for something. And uh, time will stand still for as long as it takes. For the audience, Jack's uh, blog is jackhart2014.blogspot.com, and then you can support Jack on Patreon. So, what when do you plan on having uh, another article out? I'm banging one out right now. About a weekend. Uh, this, oh, okay. this stuff I can do fast. This is not like the other stuff that requires a ton of... Re I, you know, I'm having fun now, I was telling you. Like, uh, yeah. This is time to explore the pros a bit. Man. You know, well, not too much, but, you know, I, I don't have to look everything up and document everything I'm saying. And it, it, You know, it's a, I can knock a post out a week if I really want, you know. And this is all going up on your Patreon? So. Uh, no, actually, it's going to VT. It's going up on my oh, blog. Oh, okay. Uh, but okay. but there are I'm, I'm knocking out side posts that are giving people uh, 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 views on what like like I just told you a lot of stuff that I'm not going to say in posts. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I document everything I say in those. But uh, yeah, I'm doing more like uh, you and me talking on Patreon, and I'm doing articles that are just on Patreon like that. Okay. So this is in keeping this conversation we just had with. Uh, what I'm putting up on Patreon, which is, uh, you know, I'm doing even more work now. I plan on stopping now, and now I'm doing more work. But uh, I'm hoping the Patreon will pay for it. We'll see. All right, Jack. Well, thank you so much. And as you know, you come on any time, and uh, we'll have a good discussion and a couple of laughs. We always have a couple of laughs, whether we're recording it or not. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laborofloveMusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. It has no feel
Nobody can. 